Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. This week's RTGA podcast has put on a shirt for the second time in a fortnight at his wife's uh, insistence. Uh, welcome along to, the, to this week's RTGA uh, podcast. Today we're looking at the football halfback line in our all-star team of the Sunday game era. I am very happy to say that I am joined by RT analyst Kevin McStay, a former Ross Common manager and Mayo half forward, Colin Cooper, former Kerry corner forward and in his later years centre forward where his expertise here will, will lie and also a uh, Sunday game analyst and as always Sunday game producer, series producer Rory O'Neill. How are we doing lads? Mike, how are things? Good morning. Okay, yeah, all good. Morning yeah. guys. So just in case anybody is still unfamiliar with, with what we're doing here, I'm just going to show you we're, we're, we're selecting the best football team since 1979 when the Sunday game first aired and this is where we're at now if you can see the screen we have Stephen Cookson in goal uh, we have Paddy O'Shea in the unfamiliar but totally legitimate position of cornerback because it's the all-star team of the Sunday game era James Moynihan similarly I believe one of our one of our panelists today has a word to say about that and Mark O'Shea so we've got an all carry for that line a Dublin footballer so we are here today to see where we are on the halfback line, how the voting is going on the RT uh, website and NewsNow app. But before I do that, I think I better let Kevin McStay have his speak because he said he he he, he, he has upset. issues with our full back line. Yeah. Go on, Kevin. <laughs> Mikey, it's uh, I want to start by saying this is the classic example of the danger of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and opening things up to the wider public. Um, I was talk, chatting to uh, Rory last night. And I said, this is going to be, from the get-go, we have to sort out the Seamus Moynihan selection at full-back uh, because it, it brings the whole thing into disrepute uh, immediately. <laughs> uh, before. Now, it, it, suits, it suits me because it frees up a gap yeah. on the half-back line because I, I had four going into three uh, and Seamus was one of them, obviously. And to me, an absolute cert to be number six on any team. Three doesn't do him justice. He, he can't do the stuff that he can do playing out at three. Uh, but that's where he's made it. And I was trying to f- figure out who who made the selection, but uh, uh-huh. Rory Martin are telling me it was the, it was the public uh, what done it. So I can't, <laughs> I can't blame any of you. But you, I'd you say know what, Kevin, Kevin, free. Kevin, you know the old saying, there's only one thing wrong with a public vote, and that's the public get to vote. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, 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 it's a, it's um, after, I suppose he could play anywhere, and uh, we, we'd all probably agree on that. He'd make a, he'd make, make a success of it. But he's he's six all day long. I'm sure there's a very good fullback somewhere has been slighted by not being selected either now. So, uh, but I, it is what it is, isn't it? Yes. You move on now. Yeah. Let, let's. Uh, it's Ken Brockman on the Simpsons that said he'd said it before to say it again. Democracy just doesn't work. But we'll give it another try here. This is, this is where the public are as it stands for the half-back line. We're going to leave the voting open for another couple of days so they can digest the words of wisdom from Kevin and uh, Colm and the words of nonsense from myself and Rory and make a more informed decision. But this is our top 10. Cue the music. Uh, Tim Kennelly is at 10. Jers Palan of Cork is at 9. Keno Jesus. Sullivan. Who, 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 was at, who was at 9, Mikey? Sorry. Jers Palan. And then we have Keno Sullivan. Uh, who's Jers Spillane? <laughs> Centre Sin- back for Cork when they won the All Ireland Club. Good God, I yeah. missed him completely. Yeah, Come there on. you go. Keno Sullivan, Carl Lacey, Martin O'Connell of the team of the Millennium makes it in just about into our top At six. Six, does it make it? Yeah. yeah. James McCarthy, Kieran McGinney just missing out on selection. He'll be an imposing substitute. And so the half-back line, the three players thus far voted for by the public, we have Lee Keegan, we have Jack McCaffrey, and we have Tomas O'Shea. So that's where we're at, guys. And I can tell you that there is there's daylight in terms of the number of votes between Lee Keegan and Kieran McGinney. So um, there's a little bit of recency bias sneaking in here. Um, Colm, uh, would you have any complaints about Tomas O'Shea topping the poll? 
Um, no, he would have been on my he would have been on my half back line. I, geez, James McCarthy is incredibly unlucky in my opinion. My, um, that's my fella, yeah. Yeah, James. yeah. He, he's my guy. I think he's a Rolls Royce of a player for for a couple of reasons. I suppose he can play in any of the positions. He can do a marking job. He can power through the middle and get a goal in a match. He's extremely yeah. physical and aggressive. And to me, he's been one of the most important top three, top four Dublin players in the last ten years. So he's. But look, <laughs> looking at the guys who are in there, could you could you say there's much better players I, I, like obviously I think we have to take into consideration the vote here I think the vote has been by a demographic of people who are on social media I think a lot of people would not have seen consuming Martin digital media at least yes yeah very much so Martin O'Connell in his day was an incredible player but maybe the people voting on this may not have seen enough of Martin O'Connell and, and maybe to a lesser degree Kieran McGinney but like um I look, the three players who were in are absolutely unbelievable players. I don't think you could argue. The one, the one guy who probably would have got in my team was James McCarthy, but don't ask me which one I'd leave out. I, I don't know if you can blame the recency bias entirely on the age of people voting because I've been working in the media a long time. I've never had as many texts, phone calls, angry emails from my septuagenarian father as I've had about this. He is following <laughs> this and like he's pretty tech savvy, but he's in his mid 70s. He's not Bill Gates or anything. So I do think. This is engaging with a generation. I just think recency bias, Kevin, it's something we're all guilty of because you, you, you tend to weight more heavily the things that are fresher in your memory, don't you? Yeah, well, I'd say there's a couple of things and Cullum is, is touching on them. I played, obviously, in that period, in the 80s, um, from where Martin O'Connell, just to take one, has emerged. You know, that was his period, the late, mm. late 80s, early 90s. And he was, like, obviously a brilliant, brilliant footballer. Uh, and, and there were others, like Paul Kern of Dublin was a fantastic halfback, uh, I would throw in. But I'm, I'm exactly where Cullum is as well. And, and I suppose at the expense of my own county man, B. Keegan, who was, of course, an outstanding candidate in choice. But I, I went for, uh, once, once Seamus McCarthy, or Seamus Moynan uh, was not allowed, I went for uh, James, Mc, James McCarthy at centre-back with Jack Mack on one side and Tomas on the other. And to my mind, you know, that would be an incredible half back line. Now, they're all of the noughties, really, aren't they? Um, mm. Tomas, did Tomas dip back into the 90s? He probably did a bit. Of, he did, yeah. 98, he put a play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, re, the, the recency, Mikey, I, I know you have a tech, a tech dad and so on, but you might be, <laughs> you might be in the minority there. <laughs> and, um, the, you know, this thing in statistics of the biased, the biased survey where... You ask people to respond, but they don't. They're not on internet. Like down here in the west, I, I don't know this rural Wi-Fi and rural uh, broadband. If you're familiar with this problem uh, that we have down west, there'd be an awful lot of lads down here who don't have access. I'd say there is recency, lads. No matter what way we look at it, because the coverage, well, the coverage that you know the Sunday game has provided in the last twenty years compared to the first twenty years of it, you know, is is just so more. Uh, you know, detailed, uh, and there's way more games. Of course, the games are on TV now every every weekend. Back in the eighties, used to see a live match was a uh, was a, even the Sunday. I'd say it was a big issue for the Sunday game back then. They couldn't get live live mm. match Sundays. So uh, I, I think the recent effect definitely is a factor. Now that's not to take away from what the the, the pick that both myself and I think Colum are agreed on. Um, they are three brilliant candidates, and Lee Keegan is certainly up there with them. But there's other players, you know. I just I'll throw in two or three while the discussion to broaden out it a little bit. You know, Paul Kern I mentioned, like Graham Gersey, if, if if he probably he'd probably make a forward or get very close to being a forward. But he was a brilliant back as well uh, uh, back in back in the day. Keegan definitely is is well up there. Colin Boyle isn't too far up behind either. And the other one I give an honourable mention to would be Henry Downey and Kieran McGeaney, two fairly similar uh, type players as well. So it, it all depends what we're looking for. I mean, mm. what are the, what are the, um, the, the traits of, of a wing back and, and what you want? So that, that, I'm sure we'll discuss that later on when we get into the fine detail. But recency, to answer your question, Mikey, I think it is, I think it is a big issue. Yeah. Rory, you know, you often, you, you lead the way with what the analysis is going to be on the Sunday game. And, We've kind of got away from the kind of the very blunt instrument of measuring how far someone runs. We now go into kind of what, how their power plays, etc. But a halfback is by any metric, you know, the hardest working player on the pitch, particularly wingbacks. Like they tend to run at least 10K in an average game. 
don't forget that they tend to bring to about two kilometers. It's an incredibly demanding position, isn't it? Incredibly demanding. And I think what's very interesting about it as well, it, it, it's how I would say, I know we mentioned in terms of the full back line, how that position has evolved, but I would say the half back line is a position that has evolved exponentially more because the level, I think you need to be a much more complete player to play in the half back line. You need, you need pretty much every skill. You need athleticism. You need to have a good brain. You need to have pace. You need to be, you need to have a physical presence. You need to probably have a scoring threat. You need to have courage and you need to have balls and I think all of those things when the half back line evolves I think all of those qualities are all those little incremental qualities you need to improve on whereas a, a full, somebody playing in the full back line might only have to improve certain little parts of their game because that's the only part that will be exposed over 60 70 minutes whereas a half back line and a half forwards too to a certain extent I mean if you look at We'll say the guys that are in there, like the, the physical fitness and the athleticism and pace. I mean, I was surprised actually at how high up Keanu O'Sullivan is because while well, I think he's in, he's your he's your prototype modern um, half back defender and he performed that screening task extremely well. It's very rare I would ever see Keanu O'Sullivan kick the ball. You know, he's very much a kind of a, an old school stopper, gets in the way, picks up possession, lays it off, restarts again and snuffs out danger. Somebody that I thought might have been higher would have been Carl Lacey because I just mm -hmm. thought he was a Rolls Royce. I mean, just even when Donegal were going badly, I always thought like, I think he might have picked up a couple of all stars when Donegal four, were atrocious. Four of them. Four of them yeah. I think. Which is, which is, to my mind, that's incredible because Donegal were appalling at the time and he was still picking up all stars, you know. Um, but I think that the, more than any other position, and I'd be interested in the lads' view that, like, like sometimes we see, like, you see the pace of McCaffrey and even Tomas was no slouch. Is that the most important facet to the sort of prototype wing back? Or what would, what would your view be, lads? I, th I think, Rory, looking at the three guys who've made the list, there are three marauding, attacking wing backs. I think like they can go up the field, they can get a goal, they can get a score. I think maybe that's the excitement that has given them the huge vote that they've got. Um, and they're playing, they're both playing on teams that probably have won the midfield battles in most of their matches. Like if you're playing on the front foot and you're chasing Jack McCaffrey around Cork Park, forget about it, you have no chance. <laughs> you know what I mean? Lee, Lee Keegan, if you go back three years ago, Lee Keegan was marking Dear McConnelly and still coming up the field and, and scoring yeah. and getting fouled and kicking points. Um, and Tomas did that throughout his career. Probably one thing about Keegan, I would say is I think he's much better man marker than the other two guys in the half-back line. And I think he probably doesn't get enough credit for that. He always, when there was a job to be done for Mayo, he was the guy designated to pick up probably the best forward. But he, used to, he used to swap shirts before the match was over, basically. Well, there was a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. He, got, he, got, he got up close and personal. But, but to be fair to the guy, I think, I, I think that, that he has an edge on, on, on the other two on that. And I would say, like, his man-marking ability is something that definitely stood out for me. He was physical. He need, when, he need, when, there, when, he, when there was a little bit of boldness, he had that little bit of stuff as well. So, look, I think if I go through Tomas's career, it's the longevity of it is probably what's most impressive about it. Like I, th I think he made his debut in 98 in Killarney as a cornerback and he had a tough day against Aidan Dorgan who was a small red hair corner forward from Cork Rory. You probably remember him. I do remember him, yeah. Yeah, and uh, like where Tomás' game ev evolved to there and he basically, what, what I suppose what benefit for Tomás is he was playing with his brother Dara midfield and Kerry were probably on the attack a lot and that's where we saw Tomás at his best and McCaffrey's the same. Like, just look back to Jack McCaffrey's performance in the draw in Ireland last year. I think he got 1-3. He pushed up in the second half, nearly played centre-forward. Yeah. Um, and what's happening, what's happening wing-forwards now is they're getting a job of marking a wing-back. The role is reversed because nice. if, if, if McCaffrey, Keegan have the ball and they're going forward, I can guarantee you the, the manager coming into a big championship matches, well, if Keegan goes forward or if McCaffrey goes forward, there's such a plan for them. Yeah. And I think that's... That's where the game has evolved for me so much. And that's probably why the vote has been so strong for these guys. Yeah. And, interesting, and interesting that the three, the three guys, one, two and three, have all scored goals in All-Ireland finals. Now, I know that's maybe just a quirk or a coincidence, but 
it is rare enough for a wing back or a half back to score a goal in an All Ireland final. So it's bizarre that all three of them would have one to their one to their credit. I know Tomas has came in and, and, and Lee Keegan's but Lee Keegan has two, hasn't he? He scored two goals in All Ireland final. Mm-hmm. He did. Yeah. He so, did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, suppose that does tend to kind of cat, does that tend to catapult you then into the mind's eye of people, maybe. Yeah, there's a, there is a bit of that, but bear in mind, and I can go back to when Pat O'Neill took over Dublin, and one of the biggest issues he faced at the time was this so-called marauding half-back. They were leaving the door open all the time, and he put a stop to it. Uh, Keith Barr at the time um, was uh, anchoring six, and Pat O'Neill said, that is, you know, this is your job, to, to close off the defence. And, you know, you, you mentioned there, is, is it the attacking aspect of the halfback? Is that his number one? It's not really, Rory. Uh, the number one job is to lock down the defence and cover off the middle. If you're, if, you're, if you're on the wings, obviously, that you're sagging in towards the middle. Or you're certainly keeping an eye on what might come down the middle because directly down the middle is the most dangerous avenue. You know, coming in from the sides, you, you have cover on, on, on both the central and the far side. Uh, but if you come down the middle, you have options to go left or right. So mm-hmm. that's the one the one lane that they don't want you filling. And if the, if the centre-back is beaten uh, in the initial ball, we'll say the primary, the expectation is the two wing-backs will dovetail in to cut off that threat. So that's where pace helps, of course, but the, the brain can be figuring out this could happen and, and be hedging your bet to be closer to the lane than you might other, otherwise. I, want, I wanted to ask you that, actually, Kevin. I was wondering, consider, like we're looking at where people are coming in this list. So, you know, I, I would say McGinney and your friend Seamus Moynihan. They're your archetypal centre backs and mm. football. When I was growing up, your underage team, usually the best player on the team, the most powerful player on the team, was put at centre back because he could affect the game going forward, but he could limit damage the most. It, football in Wexford, anyway, put it that way. I was just wondering if if that's kind of been if that kind of the kind of value of a centre back has been cheapened a little bit by kind of the sweeper system, the funneling back of players. Is it as important to have a rock solid centre back as it used to be? Well, uh, just to go back to the Keno Sullivan debate there now, just a moment ago, um, and I don't, I don't say this because this isn't Keane's fault. I don't say this as a, as a, as a smart ass remark. But for a lot of these game, Keane wasn't marking anybody. Mm. You know, like uh, you'd, you'd imagine you get a few kick passes in, or you'd get on the ball fairly often if you don't have to worry about uh, not marking um, a player. Um, but of course, he was covering a lot of ground in front of the D as well. So. Uh, and it's not his fault that he's not marking a player. His, his marker just dropped to give an extra defender, and, and, and they took advantage of that. Um, I think the six is still probably the pivotal position. Certainly the half-back line is the line that uh, any manager or coach will want to get right. If he can get the half-back right, you know, if he can get three, three serious players across that line, he has a great chance with his team then. Um, and I'm talking both defensively, and the attacking balance, okay? Mm. Um, obviously, you have to keep a minimum of one, if not two, at home all the time. But the ability to interact and, and, and that the, 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 with those three players you know when one can go and when... And that's all understanding. Colin mentioned longevity. And I think nearly everybody we're talking about, even Jack McCaffrey, sure, he has six or seven years, eight years played with Dublin at this stage. They, they all display longevity. That's a given if you're going to be one of the top players from the All-Star era. Um, and uh, I, I think six still is, and uh, that's why we, we love to look back at McGinney and Henry Downey, I would suggest, uh, and, and that, that type of player, Connor Gormley, that type of player, because mm. they, they really got, if you got down the middle, you earned it. You know, there might be much, there might be much uh, battery left in you when you got <laughs> through McGinney. Uh, to carry on the play, you might be very happy to dish it off to someone on your shoulder if you got past McGinney or Downey and these fellas. Uh, and, and, and that goes back in on, I'm broadening this again, to say <clears throat> the traits, like being, being the leader, being the warrior at six, still holds. It's a big, it's a big part of the game. Yeah, would, would, would you go along with that, column? I'm just thinking of a quote from, uh, I think it was Joe Brawley, was, uh, he was asked about McGinney because he played with McQueen's. He said he was a particularly ordinary footballer, but totally obsessed with uh, bettering himself. He made the best of very limited gifts, which is probably a, a very, very harsh description of Kieran McGinney. But at the same time, what we remember Kieran McGinney for was stopping the play. We don't remember him as kind of a, 
he wasn't a creative kind of uh, you know sweeper type uh, you know libero center half back, but people loved him because there was no one better. Like there was no one better at just stopping the ball coming in through his channel, was there? Yeah, and I suppose when you think about the players who are mentioning there, Keno, Sullivan, McGinney, these players, what they had was they had a great reading of the game mm. and a sense of danger and a sense of if a cornerback was under pressure and needed help, they could see that and read that. They wouldn't have to wait for a manager to tell them. They had that reading of the match. And I think that description of Kieran McGinney is particularly harsh because that, that Armad team I played against in the, in the, in the mid-2000s or the early 2000s, they were a fabulous kicking team and they diagonal ball to Ronan Clark and Stevie MacDonald and Dearman Marsden. And McGinney did that numerous times. So I think he had a lot more to, he, to more strings to his board than, than just being a stopper. Right? And he was a real leader. I think that really shone true on, on, on that type of thing. Going back to the, the Keane O'Sullivan one, it was interesting because in my la- latter years playing with Kerry, Keane O'Sullivan was kind of knocking around centre back or just getting into that role. But what the Dubs did very, very cleverly was they would, they would get a, a midfielder drop to centre back, which they still do this a little bit. And they leave their centre back go helping everybody else, and it's just a clever ta- tactic that they do. And there's no putting arms in the air. Everybody's very comfortable with what they do. But that's what Keno Sullivan had. Like Keno Sullivan's career started as a cornerback, and it evolved because of his reading of the game. And I think it evolved as well because of his athleticism. No, oh, he's um, very pacey. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. He, pace. and, yeah. And he was able to take off if if Jack McCaffrey's man was gone, or if somebody, if James McCarthy at five's man was gone, he had the pace to recover. But the big thing about this guy is it's the reading of the game. Not every, not every footballer can read the game like that. But I agree with Kevin. Having a pivotal centre half back at the, is it's worth its weight in goal at the moment because they can give you they can be your launching pad going forward, but they can also make you secure and it gives confidence to a, the defensive unit that is around you. And I think that's where the Dubs have excelled in, in the last number of years. Having Keno Sullivan there or a James McCarthy type figure that they were very comfortable in that space. But mm. uh, I, re- I vaguely remember Henry Downey's years. He was he was a very very good player for Derry. I remember when they were going well. Kevin, more of Kevin's Kevin's era, but I think McGee but was a really good footballer. Call him like really yeah. good on the ball, well able to mind it and play with it. Yeah, yeah, but McGee was a super footballer, lads, and he, he like I I honestly think that Armagh team underachieved. They could have beaten Kerry in two thousand in those two drawn games. They could have beaten Tyrone in two thousand and three. So look, there's part there was probably more in that team, and maybe he would have been higher up the up the list if, if, he'd, if he'd one or two more all Ireland stays his, his name. It's interesting, uh, Colin, we were talking about your kind of, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your autumn years playing at uh, centre forward. And, you know, it was like Darren Maloney was writing about the 2013 semi-final on the website recently. And he said, it's, and Kevin, you were his co-com that day. And he said, he thinks it's the best game of football he's ever seen. And um, the reason he gave was there was an amount of freedom for the forwards on both teams. You must, like, because as you said, Keen, you, you were kind of being picked up, but it was a bit more of a kind of you score, we score kind of game that day. And then in 2015, they said you missed 2014. In 2015, you were playing kind of centre forward again, and they thought the best way to deal with you was to bring a corner back out and mark you and Billy McMahon. Yeah, look, 2013 was was a year I, I got very fit in. And Fitzmaurice asked, asked me, would I, would I like to play there? He thought it'd be a good fresh challenge for me, and I, I really enjoyed it. The game was just evolving at that point. Um, I did my cruciate in 14. I played again in 15, and I wasn't in. I, I wasn't. I, I wasn't physically able to maybe get around the field as I once was. And I was into my. I was into my 30s as well, which was always going to be a little bit different, with a lot of miles on the clock at that stage. But that that's what I mean. Now I, I think uh, a tactic of players, particularly particularly of of the top teams, they don't just have a man marker on them. They're trying to tackle you the other way. They want you running back to drain your energy so when it comes to attacking that you don't have the same impact on the game up on the other side of the field. And that's, that's where the Jack McCaffrey's and the Keegan's and they, they run you into the ground so you've no energy to play on the other side. So that's maybe where the game has gone and nowhere exposes your lack of maybe mobility than Crow Park. Mm. It's just so energy sapping. And like to get, to get 70 minutes in Crow Park now, if you're playing in the middle diamond, it takes some getting fitness-wise. Yeah. Kevin, uh, speaking of Jack McCaffrey, actually, before I ask you this question, because I just we were trying to share a little bit of a little bit of something while we're doing these, and um, Jack McCaffrey, I think we'll all agree, is very entertaining footballer. I just want to bring us all back to the day he entertained us in an All Ireland final post-match uh, banquet here. <laughs> I remember this very good. We'll be able to blame it on the uh, painkillers, but I just want to share this for a second. I know you're for your fucking dumb one, but it worked out that way. 
Um, I suppose if it had worked out that way, he would have just adapted. Take it, yeah, it. just adapted in that <laughs> room with it, you know. So, <laughs> you get out the, the right side of the draw. And, uh, uh, that, that, that one in the interview, let me see the camera. <laughs> He uh, did something like that. He said afterwards, he said he just he couldn't get up and mingle with everybody else because his knee was banjacked. So uh, he was having as much fun at the table as he could. But away away from the banquet room and back to the pitch, Kevin, you obviously... Mikey, Mikey, sorry, yeah. just tell you one good funny story there. I don't think that was the year that uh, he won Man of the Match. I think it was the year no, before. No, after about five, seven, six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, got, he got a very bad injury. But I think it was... It was the last year of the year before that he ended up getting man of the match. And um, uh, it, we went, the Sunday game obviously comes live from the Winners Hotel on that night. And I don't know whether or not, people would remember it, I would imagine, when we were uh, live from the banquet, go back for man of the match. It's kind of like the sort of um, signature item that you would wrap up the program on. So Michael Lester is live from the team hotel. It was Michael's last, I think, was last ever broadcast, and they made a lovely presentation. The GA, the John Horn was there. Beautiful um, replica All Ireland medals from the 1984 final, and it was all going really well. And next thing, word comes through into my ear. We can't like. Do, I knew that Jack McCaffrey had won it, but he had gone missing. There was no sign of him, right? So, 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 so we're all, So I'm going. What do you mean he's gone missing? Like, where is he? Like, like, what the hell is going on? So there were just frantic running around. People are trying to find them. And so we're just into Michael Lester's ear and we're saying, Michael, just keep it going. So he's in the middle of having a chat with John Horn. And eventually Jack is found and Jack comes up onto the stage. And when he comes up onto the stage to, to hand over the award, after about five, a five minute interview with the president, John Horn, which was only meant to be one question and one answer. Next thing, the whole thing collapsed. There's like what? water. What? We nearly electrocuted the entire. We nearly electro killed the president. Killed Michael Lester <laughs> on his last. Electrocuted the man of the match. <laughs> it was absolute chaos. Yeah. And it was really funny. About four or five months later, <clears throat> Kieran Wainham was telling me he was on it. He was um he was at a function. With, with the president, John Horne. And he was saying, like, he was telling him the story and John Horne was like, Jesus, I was wondering why the interview was going on so long. They were asking me all sorts of questions. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, Kevin, he's really is one of the, the games, the modern games characters. You know, you get the impression that football isn't the be all and the end all of his life. He took a year out traveling. He talks about yeah. how the, you know, the parade is his favorite part of all our final day because, you know, you get to look around and really savor the moment and like, he just he he just seems like a very interesting character, but I'm interested from the point of view of an opposition manager. How do you plan for him? Because he, as we said, like he's kind of got everything, and but he also has. I think he just has another level that when he hits it, you can make all the plans in the world, but you're not going to stop him. Well, I suppose the first thing I, I'd say I played against, I played against his dad, who was also a very. Um, What's, what am I looking for? I would say he is like father, like son, in, in that both 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 those men. Dynamic. But I, I, I go back even a little bit deeper, uh, Rory, just so comfortable in their own skin in, about what they were doing. You know, they weren't, they're, they're not trying to impress anybody. They're not pandering to anybody. They're just going out and they're doing it on their terms, uh, which is what Mikey is saying, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and that's definitely, you know, obviously you can see that with with Jack, but but uh, Noel before him, his dad was very similar type character, not not, not as good a player now. If he he won't mind me saying that, not <laughs> not, not as good a, not as good a player as 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 young Jack. Now, how do you how do you plan for him? Well, you see, you're going to have to put someone very similar to him. You're going to have to have outrageous pace, outrageous energy, and um, I remember back in the day when Dublin were being faced with opposition uh, wrecking, wrecking balls from, from the half-back line. They used to put Jim Gavin on the dangerous wing-back, whether it was Graham Gersey or whoever it was at the time. And to a large extent, that's the tactic that a lot of managers will still use. They'll, they have to find someone who hasn't the ego, who doesn't mind sacrificing their game to sit on the likes of Jack McCaffrey. And having said all that, uh, you can sit on them all you like, and all it takes is for one mistake to be made somewhere around that midfield area, not necessarily the marker's uh, mistake. If I'm marking Jack, it's not necessarily my mistake, 
but a fella to lose possession or give a wayward pass and he latches onto it. Now at his pace and his direct running, he is up on the, on the D, on the 20 meter line in seconds. And he certainly has his, the confidence and belief that if a chance comes his way, he won't be punching the ball over the bar or tapping it over the bar if he sees the goal chance. Because it doesn't really bother him if he doesn't get it. That's my sense of it. Mm. You know, that it's a real yeah. bonus. I'm here where I am. I have a chance. I'm not going to die wondering about it now. I'm going to have a cut. And yeah. two things will happen. It'll end up in the back of the net or it'll go wide or whatever. And I'll jog back to my place. So he plays the game, to my view, and this is why I, I, I love him as a footballer, that he's so entertaining and exhilarating to watch, is that he plays it totally on his terms. He's not worried about what you're going to bring to the table, really. You know, he's going to take you full on. And you're either good enough and up for it, uh, or you're not. And that, that's my sense. He has great abandon, hasn't he? Yes, well, that's, the, that's the word I was looking for. He, he, he plays just with outrageous abandon and takes it to it. And when he's in full flight, you know, uh, and, and he's cutting through. Uh, it's, it's just unreal. To, when I, I've done co-commentary on him loads of times. Mm. And how quick he can get from the half-back line up to into a, 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 an easy shooting position with his pace. Is, it's, it's savage to see it. Yeah, and Colm, something you could say Kerry have struggled with in the last few years, there's probably a number of players, would you argue, who they could be, they could be wing forwards or they could be wing backs. And it's kind of trying to find the square hole for the square peg. It does seem more and more in the modern game that those two positions are almost merging in some ways. It's just, it just depends where you start on the field and who you're marking as opposed to... As, as, as Kevin describes there, the person you're putting Mark in, Jack McCaffrey, is basically an advanced wing back. You know, and it, it's, yeah, it's well, the two positions are swapping over. My description of Jack, Jack McCaffrey is he's, it's, it's, he's like a free spirit rocket man. <laughs> because he's just, like, like Kevin has said, he's the abandonment. He doesn't care if he scores or he misses. He'll just do it again five minutes later. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's, that's, the be- that's the beauty of him. He's just free spirit. He'll go. I, I, love, he, I love the way he, he, he's... he's just the way he handles himself off the field. He's a fun guy. He's, he's a doctor as well, by the way. Mm. And if I go back a couple of years, he's improved a lot as a footballer as well because even in, in his early days, if we go back to 13 and, and, and those type of years, he was, he was always excellent going forward and always at the pace. But I found that he, you could lose him sometimes in matches and maybe he wasn't the best tackler. He's turned that in his head. Now he's a really, really good defender as well and he tackles very... He's a lot more physical and aggressive than he used to be. And it's difficult to, sh- to shrug him off. But it's, it's like Kevin said, like when you're in Crow Park and he takes off like a Ferrari down the sideline, the, 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 the Crow Park shakes and the atmosphere that it creates. And he actually, he's one of those players, and this is, this is a sign of real greatness, in my opinion. He makes everybody around him better because mm-hmm. he creates overlaps. He covers for fellas. He can get up and down the field. He's a very unselfish player as well. So I think that's, they're the traits that have, have seen him shine, shine through. And like we say, he's there six, seven years already. Like, mm. what, what, what medal toll is he going to finish with? How many all stars is he going to finish with? And he took it's, a year uh, out as well, didn't he? Didn't he? he, he did, did. And he did, his, he did his crew sheet as well, guys. Remember that? Mm. Like, so. was, that, was that the same year he took out, Colm? Did they overlap? I can't remember. No, the year no. he took out, I think he went, to, uh, he went on a mission to Africa. Or, and then he was lucky with the crew sheet because, well, Jesus, when, how can you say lucky with the crew sheet? It yeah. happened in the All Ireland final, so yeah. the the time that he was out uh, coincided with the sort of yeah. the off season. But um, the, the 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 fact that you could just take a, I think if if I, I could be wrong, but I think he had gotten Footballer of the Year, possibly even Young Footballer of the Year. Well, no, I'm mm. probably wrong there, but certainly he was Footballer uh, of the Year. 2015, he got 2015 Footballer of the Year, and then took the following year off. All right. I mean, like, you know, like, that's because that's, that's Jack and, you know, and good luck to him. He's a fascinating character. Yeah, it's a luxury of being a Dublin footballer as well. You can take, you know, you're on a great team, but you don't fear you're going to miss that one shot at an All-Ireland either when you take a year off if you're on that current Dublin team. But still, you're right, it does take a lot of, um, it takes a lot of confidence to do it. Um, a word actually just on a couple of people who kind of are a little bit further down and, and kind of didn't, didn't quite ma- didn't make it into the top three. But I feel, Kevin, I would like you to give an appreciation of Martin O'Connell because like Brian Whelan, and he's got this mystique around him that he was a, a very recent player who was voted on to the team of the millennium. Kind yeah. of, you, might, you might tell us a little bit about Martin and what kind of a player he was. 
Yeah, I, I played against him a few times. I don't think I marked him. I was more I was more in the corner on, on Robbie O'Malley and these sort of these sort of players. Um now he, this this is where Martin was completely different. And I was making this point last night um to Rory and our, when we were just chatting. Um one of the type of players you love marking back in those days was a fellow that couldn't really play much football. Now he might be a dog, you know, as in you knew he was going to be uh, pulling, and pulling, pulling and dragging for the whole uh, 70 minutes. But uh, if he really wasn't a threat, you never, you never got too worried about being bet to the ball by a player like that. Because, you know, on his first or second step, he was going to clear it uh, and drive it down the field. And chances are you might, you know, our team would recover the ball again. That, that, that type of situation. Now, that's where Martin O'Connell was completely different. Because Martin O'Connell, of course, was the number one thing I think we're all agreed that you have to be now is uh, because the, the, this position has evolved so much. You have to be a footballer. Mm. You, have to, you have to be able to mind the rock. You have to, be able to do all sorts of things. Solo at pace, kick points, hand pass well. Spot you, you have to be the complete player. I'd say nearly more than any other position now. Uh, and Martin O'Connell was ahead of his time that way because he was a, a very classy uh, wing back um, <laughs> and kind of to a certain extent uh, stood out on that Meath team who didn't have that <laughs> style, stylus to a certain degree. <laughs> what, what would you say did it? What would you say they did have, Kevin? Kevin, I was at a lot of those All Ireland finals. You don't, you don't have to pull the wool over my eyes. I saw, I saw, I saw it with my own two eyes. <laughs> no, you're jumping across me now. I haven't finished my sentence. I did that with huge admiration. I, I, I'd be one of the, the, the Mayo crowd that has over the years changed my view of that whole period because Mead grabbed what Mead wanted and I have huge admiration for, for that and but within it Martin was a little bit different you know okay there was Giles and Garrity and the, on the later team the 90s team and there was the full forward of, of Rourke, Stafford, Flynn they were fabulous players fabulous. but the, the Mead defenders tended to be uh, no-nonsense uh, we just get it done and we'll tidy up the questions later. But Martin O'Connell was a very <laughs> stylish, was a very stylish wing back. Beautiful passer of the ball, um, uh, really strong on the right, but had a left, lovely in the air. Now, that, I, I want to go back to that point because I think this is very important and it goes to show you where the game is going as well. Jack McCaffrey and James McCarthy, two of the fellas that I'd have, uh, I have on my team would be very average in the year. Whereas Tomas would be very decent in the year. Now, Colin might, Colin might uh, tell me a bit more about that. That's my sense or my memory of it. Um, that, and this is one of the great uh, uh, losses now to the modern game, that there's no, no good catching at all on, on the wing back. It's all breaking. If you look at James McCarthy, all he ever does, and I mean this in a positive sense, is that he breaks... Uh, as is Jack. Now, Jack is small, obviously, in, in stature. He might be around the 5'10 mark, perhaps. Mm. Tomas was decent in the year. But Martin O'Connell was beautiful in the year. Very mm. stylish in the year, is my memory of him. Um, and he's desperately unlucky, I think. It's the recency. I think that, you know, there wasn't enough cameras around uh, Martin. There wasn't, um, uh, like, isn't he a three-time or four-time All-Ireland winner? He's three, anyway. Didn't he, he, he stayed on with the 90s team. 87, um, 88, 96, yeah. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, and, and, and Team Millennium, as Mikey said. So it's very hard to, pa to walk past them, but we have done that. Well, I, I have, you know, in my yeah. three selections. But, but obviously, tipping, tipping my hat to him. He was a brilliant, brilliant player. He really was. And I wasn't... Uh, I was surprised at the time, like half the country, when he made the Team of the Millennium. But when you actually went back through it, you could see why he made it. Like Martin O'Connell, rarely, if ever... I can't remember Martin O'Connell playing a bad game for me. I put it that way, and they were they were involved over a four, five, six year period, you know, especially against your fellas, uh, Rory. Uh, they were involved in massive, high profile oh, games, yeah. you know, and serious games, now, real games where there was Physical. mano mano. Oh Ooh, yeah, they were, yeah, they were full on, and yeah. you had to be in the full of your health uh, to get through them. So uh, he was brilliant in all those games. He was he was never he never. My memory is. That he rarely had a had a poor match. But it, but I but I suppose Kevin, the one kind of uh, the one extra compliment you could play, pay him is he 
he he struck me. The, 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 I saw him loads of times playing because I was at a lot of those All Ireland finals. Um, I was at the eighty seven, eighty eight, the drawn match, and I was at nineteen ninety. Like the the, he just <clears> struck <throat> me as a player that could probably play in this era, and he would still cope quite well. I w- I'd say he would have, you know, he yeah. would be, you know, you know that's is. yeah, yeah. Before we finish up, we might stick with the current era. Then I think both of you lads are insistent that Jack McCaffrey and um, James McCarthy would be in your current, you know, active players half back line. Would Lee Keegan be the, the third player there, or is there somebody else who's kind of caught your eye, caught your eye in the last year? Plus, make your, plus is my, plus is no, current. of current players, Kev. Oh, current. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Lee would be there. He would. He would. And 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 not far behind him. I don't know how the voting went, but um, Colin Boyle would be way up there as well. He was well. about 12th and 13th in the voting, yeah. yeah. And I'm not surprised. Uh, Keegan, obviously, yeah, would be the would be the, the um, player that would have the biggest say in the modern, you know, in the modern, mm. the last uh, 10 years. And he, like, very unlucky. I, have, I find it hard to leave him out myself. Like, he is, after all, probably the finest player we've produced in the last uh, 30, 40 years, I imagine, if not more. And uh, he, he'd be very unlucky. And... Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd, say the, 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 I'd say the public will the public vote. See, again, now you'd have two dubs and the curry man on the half back line. And what do we have two? What are we in the full back line? Three, three, three curry, curry men. <laughs> I guess Colum, it's getting a small bit. Well, I, th- I, I thought we were unlucky enough to get the goalkeeper lads as well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he managed it. Just before we finished up, he managed to get in his Kerry speak of man Colum. Uh, can lads. I just say, can I just yes. say on Jay, to make my case for James McCarthy? I think because if he's medal hall, it may give him a slight edge over Lee Keegan because I suppose, and he's done it in a number of positions, and that's why it's a toss of coin between the two of them. Mm. Um, but I would probably manage to be for in, in, in James McCarthy's camp because if he's medal hall, he's done it. Lee Keegan, look, you can say he's deserved to win All Irelands, it just hasn't happened for them. But I think, I think to leave James McCarthy out of it would be a little bit of a travesty, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Mikey. Mikey, can just I know you're wrap, you're getting close to wrapping up, but I just want to tidy up one one little thing if you can if you can stay with me. Please, at, please at do. We don't want to leave any loose ends here, Kev. Yeah, no, at the beginning at the beginning of the program, and I did I hope I didn't sound uh, uh, smart ass or glib, but when you mentioned Jer Spillan, I actually thought you had mis, mis- misread Tom Spillan, uh, and I missed Jer in the and I'd hate anyone to think now has been has been I didn't I don't I don't remember him, and that has been truthful, and I didn't see him on the list uh, when I was going through it last night. Uh, and I, I don't have any great memory of of, of, of his performances for Cork, but I, at the same time, I didn't want no, to be disrespectful to anybody. No, no, that's look. This this is fraught with danger. And I should I should mention here on the football podcast that the guys actually writing the articles to accompany these votes are Declan Welly and Jim McMahon, and mm. it's no easy task because you know you're mm. taking eighty or ninety fantastic footballers who are heroes in their own counties. And yeah. for the vote alone, they're having to whittle it down by 50%. And I'm getting text messages saying, Can we, do we have to leave this down? Can we put them in? And, like, you know, they're giving it a lot of thought. And, um, but, the, you know, the fact, the reality of this is not every player can get in. And if you have a, a leash footballer or a Roscommon footballer who's obviously renowned because there's not as many all-stars in those counties and they're not on the list, the people in those counties are obviously up in arms about it and feel... They should be in there. I feel the entire team. Rightly so, rightly so. Yeah, well, the Wexford Hur- the, the Hurling team should just be Wexford players, in my opinion. I'm distraught that it's not. But, you know, we all have our little biases. That's that part yeah, of, of the fun of it. That's um, it. So, listen, I think we'll leave it at that just to say just, thank just, you very Mikey, much. Mikey, yes. Mikey, just can I just make one more mention as well there? Colin might uh, let us know. Colin, the, 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 the do it for Dan, the jersey and the boots, that's been oh, yeah. flying it. Has it the, the bid? Uh, the, what's the highest bid and when's the closing point or the cutoff yeah. point? Yeah, well, look, I think most people in, in Ireland now know the story, lads. Dan is yeah. a young lad in, in County Leash and he's now and Ashley and his parents to raise the money. He need, he's a newer muscular disease and he needs to go and get very expensive treatment in America. So there's been a huge response and a lot of GA people in particular um, putting boots and jerseys. I put up my boots from the 2006 Ireland final against Mayo. Um, and my and all-star jersey. What's use for them in fairness? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a bit of <laughs> dust on them now, but... Um, <laughs> But it's it's yeah the bit, there's a bit of eleven thousand euro in which is fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And there's been how much how much you get column? Eleven thousand. Oh wow. Fantastic. Eleven thousand and the deadline is nine o'clock on Wednesday. 
So um, I'm not sure if the per- I'm not sure if the person buying them thinks the boots still work, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep it twice the price. Huh? Yeah, 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 but it's a, look, it's it's for a fabulous cause, and I would just it urge is. anybody if they want to if they want to support to go to the GoFundMe. Uh, do it for Dan Page. It's it's a worthy cause, and I think anybody who's read the story has been touched by it. How, well much, done, for, how much for one boot, Callum? <laughs> fifteen million. <laughs> fifteen million. <laughs> All right, lads. Listen, great to have you on. And um, just to say, the vote remains open on the RT website. I'll tweet it out from the RTGA account a few more times. If you want to push anybody up there, get Jer Spillan further up that list, or anybody else, Martin O'Connell, James McCarthy, get him into the top three. Lots of GA news and analysis and everything else on the RT website and Sunday Sports is back this weekend and we've plenty of archive stuff coming up on TV and also on the player so check all that stuff out so I will just say thank you and goodbye to Kevin, Colm and Rory and we'll chat to you again later in the week with a Thanks, Ricky. podcast Let's Cheers, Cheers guys. thank you all the best Possession crucial from this how much longer will the referee allow Dublin lead by a point and there's the whistle it's over we earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. What I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses!